start the recording and, and get going with our presentation, which we're really excited for. So um, welcome everyone. And thank you so much for joining us for this fourth in our series of virtual education and networking nights hosted by the City of New Westminster. My name is Jennifer. I'm the Manager of Public Engagement at the City and I'm here um, really just as uh, one of the hosts of the session and um, I'm here to learn alongside all of you and um, I'm really excited for our guest speaker tonight, Jude. Um, and I will also introduce my colleague and friend, Jen Arbo, who is our Economic Development Coordinator. And she's going to jump in and just tell us a little bit more about the Venn series. Um, and there's a teaser for our next topic on the next session, Jen. Thanks. So I have a couple of little things I'd just like to mention to everyone. Thanks for coming. As Jennifer said, it's our fourth uh, virtual education and networking night. Um, and our VEN events are designed to provide some best practices and to uh, some support uh, to our nonprofit community. And it doesn't have to be staff. It doesn't have to be a volunteer. It can just be someone who's interested in kind of the values and principles that nonprofits often kind of live by. Um, so our VEN events generally are every second month. And I can't and announce that the next one's going to be in July. So you'll have to join perhaps outdoors from your patio or outside in a park with some Wi-Fi uh, and maybe with a frosty, a frosty uh, sparkling water or something like that as well. And so it's July 21st and it's going to be about newsletters. And for the first time, the presenter will be me. So uh, I'm excited to have everyone uh, join in on that one. And I will follow up our event tonight with information on how to register for that. And the other thing I wanted to make sure everyone knew is that we also have an educational support program. So it's an educational support program that provides a bursary so that nonprofits can sign up for Vantage Point educational um, uh, offering. So they have two kind of things that they do. They have sort of one day workshops uh, and then they have a more in-depth thing called a lab. And so we're accepting up to 40 people into your choice of the one day workshops and up to eight seats are designated that we'll be providing uh, for nonprofits that are new Westminster based and they need to be either a BC registered society or a federally registered charity. Um, if you need any information about those, you can connect with me and my email is jarbo, which is J-A a-R-B-O at newscity.ca. With that, I'm going to turn it back to Jennifer and she'll introduce our guest presenter for tonight. Great. Thanks so much, Jen. Uh, I'm very honored to introduce to everyone Jude Krasta. Jude is the principal at Cobalt Strategy Group. He also works with the Simon Fraser University Morris J. Wask Center for Dialogue as a project lead for Moving in a Livable Region. He's a communicator, designer, strategist, and entrepreneur who likes to work on the front lines of those really head scratcher projects that have a larger social impact. Jude comes from a background of leadership and support roles in various nonprofit organizations. He's partnered with different levels of government and has worked on issues relating to transportation, infrastructure, education, spending, climate change, and innovation. Jude likes to volunteer for causes focusing on empowerment of newer generations on pressing issues. He is also a licensed pilot and is interested in advancements in the fields of aeronautics, particularly in sustainable aviation. Thanks so much for being with us tonight, Jude, and over to you. Take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. Um, yeah, uh, again, uh, hi everyone. Uh, really happy uh, to join you all, and thank you so much for uh, for giving me this opportunity to come and talk to you, folks. Um, um, at, uh, at times around this, you'll find uh, throughout this presentation, you are going to be uh, sort of a cathartic sounding board for a lot of the things I try to tell people that, hey, this is how we can uh, we can really reach new audiences and really engage people better. Uh, and so um, I'm hoping to make this as much of a conversation back and forth and learn from you folks, because uh, you folks are experts in what you do, uh, working in nonprofits uh, um, yourselves. And so um, I, I'm looking to get as much out of this as I'm as I'm bringing here. Um, yeah, as as was mentioned, um, 
I, I'm here uh, because a colleague of mine at the Center for Dialogue uh, referred me to this event. Um, I, I We often talk about the importance of uh, a good communication strategy. And yeah, that's important. But uh, today, I really want to laser focus on one aspect of communicating uh, value, right? Uh, the reason uh, why I want to do this is because in my work, I often find uh, people absolutely just blown away by uh, what I consider to be relatively simple set of principles that I that I myself just try to follow um, and and keep in mind when I'm trying to co uh, communicate um, whether it's a mission statement something that's really complex like a, a research academic document and then translate that for the for the general public um, or just uh, raise awareness, uh, putting our content for a general cause. Um, these are things that I that I normally go back to. Um, I also really throughout this want us to reflect on what we each consider to be meaningful out, uh, outcomes when we're talking about communicating value, um, because this changes not just uh, between organizations, but sometimes in the same organization in the same role between situations. Not uh, not all outcomes are the same, right? Uh, it's, uh, we, we we define success differently. Um, sometimes we mistake successful communication for going viral, just getting a lot of likes, getting a lot of shares. But uh, many public practitioners know that uh, when you don't lay the foundations for proper understanding of content of what you're trying to communicate, uh, something that goes viral can quickly turn very destructive for what you set out to do in the first place. You have a lot of people saying, yay, we agree. And then when you find out what they actually agree on, it's not what you wanted them to agree on in the first place. And so that's that can be that can be a real issue. Um, I'll get more into all of that in a little bit. Uh, but I just wanted to um, actually, uh, I'll, uh, we I, I did send over the poll questions. And I thought a, a little bit of interactivity at the at the front end um, uh, would be a little bit fun. So uh, Jen, if you wouldn't mind putting up the first poll question. Or right, I'm not sure. So just want to quickly know something about your organizations, nonprofits, uh, maybe in your role, or you might know of others in your role. How many funding applications does your organization submit in a year? It doesn't have to be an exact number, ballpark. Yeah, that's uh, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, most people um, falling under ten, yeah, between five to ten. All right. Um, that's that's pretty common, and we'll quickly go through them. The next uh, the next poll question. Sorry talk about we'll, we'll talk uh, I promise these matter how would you how would you rate your success in communicating with audiences <laughs> sorry I found it I found it very funny that the first answer that came in was poor it's like okay um average yep yeah, that's where that's where most people most people find themselves poor that's you know what uh, humility is a great first step uh, to, to improving, right? Uh, and our and our last question, please. So, how long has your uh, organization uh, been operating? It can be within community, throughout community. It doesn't even have to be in its current form. Um, more than thirty years. There we go. Oh, five to fifteen as well, right? Okay. Good. So uh, that gives you a little bit of sense about uh, what what your organizations are like, um, and uh, we'll we'll get to different things like funding, uh, talking about communicating with different audiences, and and just um, if if you're situated in place as a long running organization, sometimes it's always it, it, it it's it's good to every now and then take a step back and say, hmm, is this working? Even if we think things are uh, are, are going the way we we expect them to, I'm just gonna quickly share my screen here and can everybody everybody see we're all good okay perfect so i'm just going to quickly so just to go over uh, a bit of what we're going to talk about um we're we're here to essentially all of this talks about talking about your value right um 
It's a very, it's a very colloquial way to put that, but uh, that's essentially why we're here. Uh, we want to focus on um, how your organization can communicate your mission statement, your campaigns, your issue positions, uh, things that you're working on more effectively. Uh, in a way that's uh, accessible and engaging to audiences. Um, we'll look at the different ways you can communicate the same content to an audience and some of the underlying principles that are advisable to follow. Um, I definitely want this to be a conversation. If at any time you have questions, uh, feel free to raise them. Uh, I, I have tried to create enough uh, space for us to have a conversation back and forth uh, to share our own experiences so that uh, we can keep this uh, as relevant as possible to your organization organization. Um, I, 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 I want to also uh, make space though for almost all of our organizations funding acquisition is just such a major chunk of our activities. I've been I've been working in nonprofits so small where um, it's a one to one ratio of time spent to uh, like getting grant applications completed to actually delivering the program for which you're applying for a grant. Um, and while this isn't really a grand writing workshop, I do want to touch briefly on some of the ways we can retool our approach to funders because they are an audience, uh, humans just like a, a regular audience a, a person would be. Um, and I want I want also to take a look at operations and logistics, um, just so that we're we're understanding internally how we reinforce certain principles of communicating value with staff and volunteers, and also how uh, we engage with organizational stakeholders, whether it's your board of directors, uh, partner organizations that you work with, uh, or even external stakeholders uh, that you identify a uh, program to program. Uh, there are certain commonalities between all these approaches, um, and there are also subtle differences, uh, and these differences can be important to maintaining an efficient uh, communications uh, operation. Um, we're going to touch up uh, on some of the things to consider when selecting audiences for different communication tasks, and we're also going to explore some of these further. Uh, there are some important things to consider when, look, when trying to get audience uh, parse out uh, who would be a good audience member for different content. Um, it may seem funny, but while we objectively know that people are individuals with differences, subjectively, this understanding may not always feed into how we operate. And we, and, and we just default uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, generalization about uh, uh, when we release our content. Um, I want this to be super relatable again. So uh, if you have group examples you'd like to share, we'll have a space for that at the end, but I'll also pull up uh, um, a recent example of something that I worked on uh, just to give you a sense. Uh, there are a couple of things where I was trying to think of what's public and what's not to share. Uh, and so this is a, this, this would be a good example of, um, of how you can communicate something with not so much content that's super technical um, and but also needs to be super accessible Accessible to somebody who knows nothing about the topic and probably doesn't even know that they should care. Um, after all of that, we'll close off with some questions and comments. Um, does that sound good for everyone? Right? Okay. So just uh, to quickly let you know, uh, I've told you, uh, work. Uh, I, uh, my colleague and I set up Cobalt. Uh, again, we generally help NGOs, individuals, uh, businesses with public relations, engagement, policy development, and networking. Um, I also want to plug in uh, our event series that we do. Uh, we have done before COVID, and we will return to that soon. Uh, we. Uh, I, I know we, we had talked earlier about the fact that um, oftentimes cost is a huge barrier, uh, even something as low as uh, five dollars uh, for, for the right person uh, can, it can prevent them from just going to something. Uh, and uh, so uh, we my, my colleague and I, we launched this series called Exchange uh, that we host uh, physically uh, when we were able to host was in downtown Vancouver. It's completely free, open to everyone. Uh, we'd have and we try to get the experts on different issues that aren't traditionally uh, talked about in a public engagement sphere. Uh, we'd get them, have people engaging and try to mingle about that. We, we've had uh, Attorney General David Eby on twice uh, with Sandy Garasino, uh, 
reporter famously to talk about money laundering in, in BC and things that people should know. Like um, it's not something that you'd have a public uh, event on and, and make an evening out of, but we, we said it was free. We fed people uh, through sponsors uh, and, uh, and, and everybody had a good time. Everybody had an open conversation and actually saw some pretty interesting things that made its way to the news. So um, once, once it's open, if anybody would like to learn more about that, uh, happy to happy to uh, add you to our, our list for uh, invites. So, just some of the basics. Uh, getting into it, um, when communicating your value, one of the most important things you have to ask yourself personally: um, what is your goal? essentially when you're in embarking on this communication. It sounds super simple. Everybody says, oh, well, what do you want to do? You need to be clear on what exactly you want someone to get out of visiting your website, reading your report, looking at a social media post, because if you're not clear on that goal yourself, then neither would that person who's visiting and neither would that audience person be right you need to decide are people looking uh to download a bunch of information from the content that you're putting out or are you um and and when they're downloading are you then saying okay i'll just take a chance if it sinks sinks in it sinks in if it doesn't it doesn't whatever i just need to get this thing out um or do you want people to engage to interact to reach out learn more volunteer, share it among their peer networks. And um, th this sounds like a leading question. It sounds like, oh yeah, obviously I want people to engage, but sometimes uh, you don't. So sometimes you, 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 you're you obliged to put out information in a release or something on your website and, and you say, okay, that just needs to be be there. So if you're here to fulfill an obligation, then yeah, good news. You don't really don't have to do much and your, your job's pretty much done. Uh, you can wait for the informal part <laughs> at the end of this. You don't really have to listen. But uh, if, if you're trying to achieve those more complex goals, then yeah, we've got some work to do, right? Um, to frame this, uh, there's a bit of a cheeky question, but ask yourself, is your site, uh, your website, is your uh, report, uh, whatever communications product you're putting out, is it any more engaging than the, than the Income Tax Act on the Government of Canada's website, right? Because if you if you look at the income tax and you're like, huh, this reminds me of my own website, uh, you've got some problems, right? Um, you're going to encounter an organization with such specialized expertise and experience and practice that chooses to go through that single scroll page in black and white. Uh, sometimes you might even have brand colors, sure. Um, but the format is pretty monolithic. You have paragraphs of text. Sometimes you'll throw in a square uh, picture or two. Um, but it's it, it, it's pretty sterile, right? Um, and yeah, this is not a roast of smaller organizations. I've like I've literally this this has been my thing. I've evolved my understanding uh, of how people communicate. This is what I'm saying. It's a learning exercise. And yeah, it's uh, it, it it also happens on big government websites, corporate websites. These these are things that happen all the time, and it, it can drive people nuts when 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 people don't engage after going through a website, uh, and 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 be accused of not being transparent when you had the information right there, right? So, let's explore that a little bit further uh, when we're talking about. Um, is, is your content engaging? You need to, you need to understand, okay, um, your mission statement, your uh, project uh, goal uh, statement, uh, the, the headline, that's cool, yeah, that's amazing, um, but we, we can just leave it right there. Um, there, there, are, there are really um, some key principles that we need to be looking at. Uh, these are things that I've personally found uh, most effective. Again, um, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you, well, if you follow this, this, th th this is your self-help starter guide and buy my, buy my new book on, on, on the shelves at Indigo, right? It, th these are things that I've personally found very helpful that uh, honestly, if a lot of people really like it, maybe there's something to learn from it. Um, when talking about your organization, number one, are you communicating your purpose are people feeling your passion over than just the tagline that you're putting out? Um, and are you specializing this to your issues, right? Are you communicating the issue or project purpose in a way that shows that you actually care about it? 
because oftentimes you are convinced of your passion. You're, you're working at the, uh, hopefully you're passionate about what you're, the organization you're working for, um, but that might not come out to people that way. Um, sometimes uh, putting out a paragraph of something um, might seem like a great engaging way to really communicate everything, but um, it's not where somebody else is at when they're when they're approaching this as a viewer. Uh, uh, Pamela, you were talking about the event that you're going to tomorrow, and I, I felt a little bad when you said it because I was like, oh, that takes the wind out of my sails a little bit when you're writing for the reader. Uh, yeah, you're writing for the reader, right? Um, but um, let, let's look at that when we're talking about writing for the reader. Um, there are often gaps in information that we that, that exist in our blind spots, right? Because you're an expert, you're a practitioner, you're a staff member for the organization who has been indoctrinated into the policy proposals, into the operations manual, into whatever onboarding you've had and experience working for the organization. You might even be an academic in the field, but it's guaranteed that you are in an echo chamber. Even if, you, even if you're hanging out in bars with friends who don't work for your organizations, you are still in an echo chamber because your, your brain is thinking like a practitioner. The general public almost always does not understand a certain issue and why you even care about it. Like you, it's, it's like you find this all the time where you're like, oh, I, I really don't wanna uh, overly go into this in front of my friends because they're gonna find it annoying and, and they're gonna think that's all about. But that's just because there's a gap in understanding, right? They don't understand why you care this much. Um, without seeming condescending to people, you need to bridge those gaps in understanding, not just in words, but how you present the information. If you're, if you're again, putting out uh, text like a novel, that's not really saying to people that, oh, I'm looking at this from a non-academic sense or an accessible sense. If you're putting it out in an interactive format um, with pictures, accessing different things, uh, and really breaking things down in, in, in news writing, they'd say at a third grade level, um, it really shows that, okay, you're trying to help me understand. Even if you're not doing something as like, well, if you don't understand X, let me explain it to you. It, it's like, no, if you just take the time to bring people along organically, people will more like very often follow along. They're, 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 they're happy to learn. It, like you might think an issue is well publicized. It might seem like, oh my God, we've had CBC spots on this. People have been talking about this. Um, like our organization works on something that is so mainstream. Of course, people already know, right? Like this, like they, they, like we've said this word so many times. Everybody's talking about this. The Google results for the for this word are crazy. People like noise about a subject does not equal understanding. That is a key thing. And it goes back to my previous point, going viral does not mean that people understand anything. If COVID has taught you something, is that you, like, you could treat yourself from COVID by using bleach. That went viral. That did not indicate on any level a proper understanding of epidemiology or medical science, right? Um, in the age of social media, people are bored uh, and people will share anything. Uh, and, and so you need to you need to pay real close attention um, to what you're trying to say, how you're seeing it. Um, otherwise, you can have that narrative uh, run away from you, or at worst, people just walk away from the topic. Um, without belaboring that too much, ask yourself whether you're uh, using a blanket approach or a customized approach for your audience. Uh, or the different audiences that you might have. There are more than one ways to say the exact same thing. Sometimes it might sound crazy, but you might put out a flyer, an info sheet, infographic, um, and say, okay, well, I put out an infographic and this is the most simplest way I could put it, uh, and then broadcast it across Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. It may seem like a waste of time, but creating five versions of the same infographic to rephrase exactly what you said, it, you might feel like, oh my God, I'm such a fraud. This is such a make work thing. It is super helpful. It is very, very helpful. Um, uh, sometimes certain, like, certain words just click for people. It, it, it's literally no different if you ask, if you try to rationalize the difference, between, like there's no difference between what you said in version A, version B, people just responded to version B. It's, it, 
it's it's often manifested in, in in the example of like if you let people like sometimes believe that it's their idea they're more willing to do what you want the, the thing is that it's that concept though is nothing fancier than if you just help people understand in a way that they process information themselves they're far more likely to engage it's not some slide of the hand. It's not some magic trick. You're not some mentalist or anything. It's just that, oh, you said it in a way that I think, okay. <laughs> like that the, sometimes it's, it's, it's that common sense. And it sounds super simple as uh, simple. And, 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 and you're like, oh, well, is it really that easy? It's not that it's easy. It's just that we discount it because we're like, oh no, it, it can't possibly be uh, that common sense. Um, but one of the most important things that I want to lead into before we get into some of the conversation bits, um, the most important thing that I've seen so far that people really respond to uh, in a pinch is making things shiny. I will go and define what that means later. But if there's one thing that I try to impart to people when they ask me, oh my God, you really changed up this report. What did you do? I was like, there's no, there's no way I can summarize it. And then saying, I just made it shiny. And like people really like shiny things. And, and so I, I'll, that's a bit of a cliffhanger. Before we get into any further, I've talked a lot. Uh, I want to open up. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a second. Stop share. Okay. That's just want to give us a break from me talking so that everybody feels that they're immersed in this a little bit. Um, I, I just want to hear from you. Um, what type of organizations do you lead uh, in, in terms of what are the challenges and difficulties you've had uh, in communicating your mission, your a, a particular issue or a, a sp very specific project that you've been working on? Feel free to chime in. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about some specific tactics later, but yeah, Yuri. Hi. Um, so I haven't been with New West uh, Hospice Society for long, only a couple of weeks, and it is a fairly new organization. It's about five years since um, it, it began. And what I'm seeing just from an outside, you know, so it's perfect that I come in not really knowing, you know, what to expect and what I'm supposed to be seeing because I understand what I see as a little outdated, a little too quiet and not shiny. I love what you said about shiny because it's true. People want to see something that, you know, because a hospice society obviously is not a, a, you know, a fun, exciting topic, but it's also a very important one that we need to, to normalize and talk about and, and get it out there. So yeah, like everything that you're saying about, do, you know, using different words with different, you know, platforms, like these are great, great ideas. So I yeah. think I trailed off. Did you ask me? <laughs> no, 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 it's that's perfect what you're saying because yeah, take the case yeah. of the hospice, right? Very mm. serious. It, it like yeah. at no point do you ever want to diminish, uh, dilute, or in any way understate the importance of the topics that you're working on. It, it is a, it, like a lot of the decisions with palliative care itself can uh, are, are very serious ones for families, but again and we'll i'll get into the the how shiny could relate into that uh and mm -hmm. i don't want to sound like a buzz concept but um the it, it, it at the same time when you present information and you're and you if you're approaching it from a medical practitioner or somebody who's working in end of life care uh, decision making um you naturally are are shaped by the experiences of your environment like the legal requirements of how you communicate a lot of the stuff you're you're communicating um how what is the standards for the for the sector that you're working in but for a lot of people who are coming into the who are family members those who are in their uh in in palliative care themselves they're just there they're, they're they're just there they, they they don't know your nine to five your meetings they don't um they, they they don't know what the standard is in the industry they've never met the legal team who would really carefully navigate uh, assisted dying things like that um it's for them it's as simple as like my relative needs help um mm. what are the things i should be thinking about and sometimes they don't even ask the questions right 
the a, a, a big aspect of communicating value is that sometimes you want to answer questions for people that they didn't know they had um, beforehand. And this can be difficult. It takes a lot of practice in the work that you're doing, but sometimes things can be very important, but some, uh, you don't know what you don't know, right? If you're, if you're a person who's coming into something uh, and, you're, and you don't have any knowledge about the topic, how do you know what to ask? Like asking a question relies on, on some basis of information, right? And so if you, if you just don't know that topic, sometimes forecasting is a good idea um, where people might come in. But also at the same time, um, people trust you a lot more and, and understand implicitly that you have their best interests at heart when you're able to say, hey, you didn't think about this, but here's that. And they're like, oh, wow, okay. I didn't even think about that, but thanks for bringing it up. Like that, and not just in hospice care, hospice care, that's very important, but in anything. Like people, people, when you're approaching it from a, uh, from a place of authority on a, on a topic, whether you're government, non-government, uh, uh, whatever that is, um, showing people, even on a very benign topic, that you have their best interests and value priorities at heart. Uh, we often don't think of it in that terms because they're like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just here trying to give people grant. Like if your project is giving people money, they're like, oh, I'm just trying to give people money. And it, why, why, why do people seem cold sometimes about, about me giving them money? And you're like, well, they don't think you're trying to give them money. They, they think you want something. Like, it, 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 and they have a lot of questions that they don't know how to ask yet. And they don't know how to ask it properly. And so just thinking about that beforehand, even if it's completely in their benefit and you have no ulterior motive, assume that if somebody with an ulterior motive was uh, was approaching them, what questions might they have? Like what might they be concerned about? Through COVID-19, that's that that's for, at, the, at the Center for Dialogue. Uh, that's really what we approach when we put out information for youth on how to access government services. We're like, okay, if I'm scared, like really scared right now because I've been laid off. I don't have uh, like I'm I'm in. Uh, I might have to withdraw from university because I don't have income and things like that. What am I looking for? And, and we designed a website uh, called wegotyou.ca. We like we even workshop the name, and we were like, "What's the one phrase for like millennials and Gen Z who are approaching this?" They're like, and I was like, "We always tell our friends every time they we want help. What do we say to them? We're like, we got you." And I was like, "Let's just make that." the URL and we don't have to explain the, the website to anyone. The moment we say we got you.ca and this is about getting help for COVID-19, we didn't really have to explain that much more. They are like, oh, okay, this is about where I can go and get help and this is the, the place I need to go to. And we were like, we were like a, a lot of folks from Toronto and everybody were trying to use it at UFT. SFE was using it, UBC was using it. It's just one of those, one of those things, right? Sorry, again, I'm going on, but yeah, uh, any, anybody, uh, thanks so much, Yuri, for that, yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Crystal. Um, I sometimes work in fundraising and I'm just wondering if you have any tips on moving away from programs-based text. Uh, for example, hey, we have this event. These are such and such people. Um, you're invited to more values-based uh, languaging and how to go about that. Right. So this, um, hopefully, when you're asking me this question, it's not too late uh, in the in the process when getting into these events. And I'm not saying that as in like a, this, uh, to be all doom about it. But um, sometimes uh, before people even see the event uh, listing, uh, they, they might need to be implicitly sold on the purpose of the event and why it's taking, pl uh, taking place, why they should even attend. So building out um, some of the, the why you'd want to be here, why the topic is important, uh, really fit in the stories. Uh, stories are really important. People, uh, whether people uh, read books uh, or, or admit to liking stories, people relate to other human experiences. Um, if, if you can relate an issue topic and the why behind an issue beforehand, uh, people are very much uh, uh, more willing uh, to engage um, in terms of uh, specific programs, um, getting down into the human aspects of how a program could help you 
Um, moving away from negative doom language is very important. People respond much more to positive uh, things that they could get out of something. Um, that's uh, that's a good area. Um, you would go a lot more than writing an introduction paragraph by putting out uh, a very simple, hey, we're doing this. This is what the topic's about. Uh, and then putting out a, a series of infographics, like like with big, bold numbers, big figures, like, uh, I don't know, pick a, pick a random topic. They're like, just put out a big number 20. And it's like, and, and then a small tagline of like, 20 ways you uh, like you could actually uh, like get help uh, during COVID-19, get uh, funding help through COVID-19. This is what we're talking about. It really stands out bold. It draws the attention to people more than in paragraph. Um, and over the and and when you complement that with stories of like, uh, are you a small business owner? Do you own a restaurant? Have you been forced to close? We know this is hard. Uh, we understand. Um, and, and try to think from their perspective, what might they be looking for if they're, if they're desperate for that help and trying to reach out um, and thinking, what might I want to hear in that moment? Um, that, that's how you'd, uh, how you'd phrase that. Um, it's important when uh, listing the speakers for an event to make, um, when they provide you with bios or things like that, to make their experiences, their work experience their qualifications super relatable to people who might show up. Because if they're trying to hear from people, they wanna know, okay, how, how does a PhD in um, uh, economics help me when I, 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 I'm struggling to make RRSP payments? Like that, that really doesn't, that, that, that doesn't, that doesn't speak to me. Right. But if you say, apart from uh, X has a, she has a PhD in economics, you say, well, actually Dr. So-and-so worked in this field where she actually looked at, at ways that working class people can, are, are able to uh, move away from property ownership and, and traditional vehicles of, of gaining capital, uh, uh capital strength to more accessible ways and then you list out some of those accessible ways uh as a teaser people are like oh okay that th that that makes sense because yeah if if you're if, this is super specific but if your secret to me saving money was okay buy a property 70 years ago <laughs> like okay that's 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 not really uh, not not really helpful Right. But if it's like, oh, you understand where I'm coming from here, you understand where I'm at and you're trying to meet me halfway, uh, people are more likely to engage. The, these are all very specific examples, but I think that's the best way I can characterize some of the, how helpful that might be. Perfect. That was really comprehensive. Thank you. All right. I'm just trying to um, let me have an opportunity in case any other uh, comments or questions before I move on to the shiny. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let me go back to sharing screen. Um, okay. uh, assuming everybody can see this. I get to, uh, oh, already covered that. All right, the shiny. Um, in other words, high production quality. And now um, this can mean a lot of things, um, but shiny is an acronym and it stands for super high, are you getting this down? Super high information. I'm just kidding, this, this, is, this is me trolling. It stands for nothing. It, it, it's, it, it's, just a, it's just a stupid way to ca characterize high production quality, the shiny. Um, it seems like a very simple, very, um, <laughs> silly way uh, to um, characterize this work, but it, it takes a lot of practice. It's not, it, it's not complicated in the sense that you need a, a specific degree, you need, you need to work in psychology or things like that to understand like what, 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 how people would think about something. Um, but, but it does take a lot of practice and, uh, and being open to uh, critique, understanding that uh, what might work for uh, some person uh, doesn't work for another. Mm -hmm. High production quality. Okay, let's make this and feel free to chime in. This can be an open session of you calling out things, uh, everything. How many senses do we have? Five. Five, right. Okay, 
Um, how many, quick show of hands, how many people have been to a concert, a music concert, uh, um, or Disney World, um, yeah, uh, uh, have been to a concert at Disney World or, or that type of a theme park? Right, okay. Uh, I'm seeing hands, okay, okay. So almost, almost all, I think, on the call. So, even if you haven't gone to that, the movies also is, is as close to an example. So ask yourself, why do you, when you had the opportunity, why did you go to a concert, right? Like, what was the purpose of going there specifically? Because it, it, I can guarantee you it wasn't just to listen to music. Because if you wanted to listen to music, if you want to listen to an artist or the track, you could have just done it at home. Right, and it probably was far more comfortable, uh, and like to just listen at home. When you go to a concert, a lot of the times people describe the feeling of going to their first concert. It's like, yeah, the music was great. Obviously, you went there because you like the artist, but it was the feeling of being in the crowd with the people, the the lighting, the smell of the place, like the the the, the energy in the room. People say they're like, I just can't describe the feeling. Right? It's it's not a it's not an accident. Like it, the same thing with Disney World. Why do people call it like it's, it's this whole thing of like, oh my God, it's so magical. Like everybody's like, it's, it, the thing is that it, it's such an immersive experience because a lot of companies sp spend a lot of capital. They invest a lot of money uh, into research that constantly goes into uh, improving all the factors of experience all five senses like disney world has air fresheners in different in different uh parts of the theme park that put out the sense of things that you're supposed to be smelling when you're in an environment like that they paint buildings brighter or duller colors based on buildings that they want you to go to and buy stuff from the texture of tiles and railings in disney world vary based on what era they want you to feel. You'll notice that everything is on brand, whether you're staying in the resort, whether you're in the park itself, and there's very little things to take you out of world. It's because they know that when you're in there, like people experience things not just by looking at something, it's everything, right? So um, you're probably thinking, okay, what the hell does that really mean? Uh, we're not opening a theme park here. We're just looking at getting people to talk about our projects. So let's focus on one of those senses, right? Vision. Because that's really in a digital in a digital world, apart from audio, most of the time that's really all you have access to. Uh, even in even in the physical world, when you're putting up reports, uh, things like that, vision's all you got, right? When we look at or read something, we're not just processing uh, words on a page. We think we are, even if it's a dull document, but we're what we're actually do, doing when we process vision, we're, we're processing motion, we're processing color, brightness, form, a whole host of things that go on in the background. And we think we're just seeing words on the page or screen, but there's a whole host of that information from the visual data that, that forms your, uh, on, your thought process. It shapes even your opinions on something. Uh, you start to notice these uh, processes when you lose them. Sometimes when you, when you see um, a movie or a, a TV episode or a news uh, press conference and you're like, huh, like it, it, it feels like they didn't put a lot of effort into that. Or, or you're like, huh, it, it, uh, it wasn't super engaging. And it, but you're like, I can't quite put a finger on it. It's because all these little things that people pay attention to in the background that you don't think uh, consciously, they just didn't do that. You didn't know they didn't uh, they didn't do that, but it but it took you immediately out of that experience from what you would expect. Um, so when, when it comes to politicians, the hair, like the hair has to be a particular length, the color of the tie, Obama's tan suit, like that was that was such a wild controversy to have, but it, these are things that you never noticed the color of Obama's suit before. Like you, you, like you're like yeah, it's navy blue, charcoal gray, like whatever. But the moment it was moment that color was off from your pro, you're like oh wow, this this seems unprofessional. Why? Why does it seem unprofessional? It's it's a color, and so similarly now all this all sounds like okay again. How does this relate to me? When you present information to your audience, the quality of the production, even as even something as simple to your board of directors for a report, just taking the time to pull out infographics, 
put things in a new format, making things look a little nicer, um, it, it changes the perception. It conveys a lot of things. Paying attention to all these color fonts, format shapes, negative space, I'll go into what negative space is, um, it changes what people perceive as the value of what you put out. Like if it's easy to access uh, the, uh, the information, that's when they pull out from there. Sometimes it even uh, helps people form a judgment on whether you are an authority on a subject. Like uh, you don't know uh, objectively whether an iPhone is better than every other phone out there. But if you're a person who likes iPhones, it's probably because Apple spent a lot of time cultivating an image to really make you think you were getting the best product, including the price. And so um, it, it, like sometimes making uh, content super simple, removing a lot of words on the page and putting very little actual physical information may seem like a, a con in academia and professional circles. But if you tailor that production value for the audience, you, like you could have government ministers read a report page to page just because it looked shiny. And I'm saying that from personal experience. Very recently, I had to work with, um, at the Center for Dialogue, um, we, we're, we're organizing a sort of Team Canada approach with cities uh, uh, for leading up to uh, the Glasgow Climate Conference, COP26. And we've had government ministers there. We are, we've had uh, national organizations there, people who get reports across their desk. And we just took a different approach. Instead of putting the regular government format that you would for a formal letter, I can't show you that document because it's not the Republic yet, but I'm gonna show you another example. We really took a very what somebody described as a very artsy approach, and 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 they were like, I don't know why. Normally, I didn't think that an artsy way to put out information about GHG greenhouse gas emissions uh, would be the way to go. But just putting it out like an art gallery would put out a painting. Um, they read a, they read an eleven page briefer cover to cover, which is not something government ministers ever want to do. A briefing report is one to two pages maximum. They read it and they were like, oh yeah, okay. Do you have a follow-up report uh, from this meeting that you could put in the same format? I'd like to read that. And so the, it, it's, it, it's something that again, you didn't do anything spectacular. I guarantee you the information I put in that document was less than something they would get in a regular briefing report uh, that really went into it paragraph by paragraph. But they got everything they needed to. Number one, the, the the quality of the content was not reduced, and number two, they just didn't feel tired <laughs> coming into the meeting after reading the briefing report. Right. So again, I'm really hammering this point. If it seems like I'm belaboring this, and you already got the point, you want me to move on. The only reason I'm doing this is because forgetting the shiny and not seeing the value is so easy, right? Because you can put a dollar return to it. Like, but 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 the rewards of just sticking to it and, and always making sure that whatever you're doing, put out that content, production value, put out that production value. People just form a base understand, like per, uh, uh, perception about your organization that, oh yeah, you guys are authorities on this matter. I need to, I need to listen to you. All right, let's quickly go into ops and logistics. And so now we're getting into some of the specific cases for funding and things like that. So um, you probably are using um, Smart Simple, SurveyMonkey, uh, whatever um, grant application portal that foundations are using um, or uh, different family uh, estates are using. Sure, you have a standard uh, grant applications. Um, you, you go through the regular process. Um, and so if you've, even if you've never uh, like touched a grant application or you've never had to do a grant review uh, interview uh, or fundraise publicly, um, it's, it, 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 this is something that, that everybody can keep in mind. I'm not gonna pretend like there's a perfect way to do this. Like right off the bat, I'll be honest, th there are good ways of communicating value in a grant application um, and talking about your work. There are experts in grant writing who like, which again, I'm not uh, specifically, and I'll admit that, but a lot of the time uh, when reviewing these things in grant committees that I've, I, I've been a part of review committees, 
sometimes it can really boil down. We underestimate how much the perspective of the individual person sitting in the grand committee affects an application, like a stellar application. Like it, I've caught myself sometimes being in a bad mood because of completely unrelated things that happened at home. Uh, and looking at a grant application, I was like, no, I need to look back at that application because I don't think it was as I, I I marked it as fair as I possibly could have. I think I was a little I was a little upset and I didn't have enough coffee. It's like it, it's a it's like all applications, things like that require subjective decision making. Everything is influenced by people's tiredness, stress levels, the amount of attention span they have, and the amount of applications they've read. Um, sometimes they might even have many prejudices about the words you're using in an application just because they've heard it repeated in the cohort. And it's completely random, right? Like you, you couldn't pick who, who else applied, but sometimes that affects whether you get money. So that being said, there are things you can do when communicating with funders to be more efficient that way. And, re and even this is not something at the time of application, even with donor um, uh, uh, past procurement, but donor relations and stewardship, that's a very important part uh, of maintaining your funding. Um, and this is a time where you can really reinforce why you should be funded in year two, year three, year four, or even when the time comes to reapplication, why this should like consider you. Um, and this goes back to high production value and applying those four principles. Um, you might, uh, you, you, we, we want to make sure that when we're submitting free format things like a, like a grant report, uh, supporting documents, even, uh, uh, even letters of recommendation, if, uh, if, you, if you ensure that everybody's uniform in the letterhead, everything looks good, seems super legit, uh, your website that you link to, on your grant application is stunning. These are these are things that that are just more likely to get you funding because implicitly they're like, okay, these people know what they're talking about. They have a really good website. <laughs> like it's like they spend a lot of time doing this. Um, uh, for your, uh, you, you want to make sure also that in those documents, storytelling and bridging the gaps of information. Going back to the four principles, very important. I've been on grant review committees where I've received uh, funding applications for a project to bring uh, heat mapping technology for populations back when Google didn't even have this or Snapchat didn't even have this. I did not know what I was looking at. Um, and at that time, um, we were about to pass on the project like, uh, on funding it at UBC. Like it, it, it was after we decided to move them into the grant interview stage and they were like, oh, okay. Like I see what you're talking about, um, and and then and, and then I, I'm not sure if they ended up being bought out by Google, but like whatever their tech was, it ended up now as Google's tech. So um, I'm not sure how that relationship worked on. But what I'm trying to say is that could have easily gone the other way. We could have had no patience, been super tired at 5 p.m. and we're like, I, I don't understand this. They didn't make enough of an effort out, right? But again, super important. Uh, Enough about the funders. Let's talk about quickly staff and volunteers. Um, we can reinforce good practices and a standard of production quality uh, among your staff. Uh, and 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 I and I don't say this. To, uh, I wouldn't approach this in a very prescriptive, demanding way. This is something that needs to be done with training, setting clear examples. Um, following the principles yourself, like sometimes if, if, if people don't feel that you believe in communicating value, they're, they're not going to do it themselves. Um, supporting those on your team who might need help, because again, no one's perfect at this. I'm not perfect at it. It's a learning exercise. I get feedback all the time of people who want to be, who want things to be tweaked a certain way. And that's perfectly fine. And oftentimes uh, providing an encouraging environment that allows people to be individual and creative and bring their own lived experience to things immensely helps how you're communicating value. More often than not, people just don't talk about it, but they might have a cousin who actually is very uh, closely affected by X project. So you're like, why didn't this ever come up before? Like, oh my God, this was something that we could have talked about. And there's so many people like your cousin who if we just put out a social media post, infographic, telling that story, of course, while maintaining privacy, so many more people would have would, would have been able to hear, right? So encouraging that among staff and volunteers, helping like giving them a space to volunteer that perspective, that's great for communicating value. Keep in mind that not everybody's job duties needs to be burdened with this approach. If you are a nonprofit and you're small, 
um, you don't have space for everybody to do that, sure. An internal memo between staff does not need branding, yeah, uh, or graphic design for that matter. But sometimes an internal board meeting could use that one page graphic info sheet. You might know everybody on the board, but if you feel sometimes that the board's not getting it, that, they, that, that, that you have to do a lot of follow up, just putting out a very graphic, uh, like high production quality document, they might be surprised to be like, whoa, it's like you guys spend a lot of time on this. Like, like, why is this suddenly so engaging? Or you might just notice that they don't even give you an explicit compliment. They just start asking questions a lot more and start offering opinions and, and the engagement is a lot more valuable in a board meeting. Um, so enough of that as well. Let's move on to stakeholders, which is, uh, I, I want, I want to go a little bit into that, but, um, just make sure that when we're, when we're looking at it, um, you can't be half passionate about communicating your passion, right? You have to make sure that everybody on the team understands why you're passionate about something and why they should be caring about it and how they can communicate things. So bridge the gap for your staff and volunteers as well. Uh, it will go a long way. Now for stakeholders, uh, you need to you need to make sure ask yourself are your stakeholders uh, defined right uh, and how do you want your audiences to be selected uh, let's explore this a little bit further there because there are some important principles that often get lost and this is something that you find a lot more even in social justice and equity circles that are coming up more and more uh, about principles to engage with people now of course this isn't a deep dive into things like important topics like critical race theory or things like that i'm not an expert in that but these are general things on the comm side that uh, could be worked on um you need to pick out who you're going to say uh, things to what you're going to say to them and when you're going to say to them uh things are important everybody has important jobs we all care about important issues but not everything is important to everybody all the time right People have priorities. Sometimes it, it, it's, it, it, it's as simple as saying uh, when somebody's on the street, there's a funny example of like somebody's on the street, they're approached by a canvasser uh, who's, uh, who's trying to raise funds for, uh, for water filtration systems in, in, in an impoverished nation. And, and they're like, oh, I can't, I, I have to quickly run, uh, run for something. Uh, and, and they're like, well, don't you care about people starving in, in developing countries? And it's like, I didn't say that. <laughs> that's but right now. That's I, I. If if I if I stop and talk to you, my kid's going to be stuck at daycare, and the daycare has a very strict policy about leaving your kids behind, and they're going to get very upset. So, really pick the right time to say things to people, and keep in mind they they, they need you to really break it down to super relevant points for them. Um, here are a couple of things though when you're looking at audiences, consider. Uh, a couple of things like age and generational differences. This can affect your language that you're using, the visual engagement preferences. Um, um, this is something that comes up. Uh, it's it's a very it's a very simple example, but white and yellow uh, for uh, for older generations does not work on, on on websites. I I it took me a while to learn this because it wasn't so much that they that they pointed it out that was the, that it was bad for them were for people who had lower color acuity. They just start they just weren't picking up entire pieces of information. I was like. Is, I'm starting to notice a trend here, and it's just that, oh, I see, the contrast is not high enough, and so people's monitors need it to be adjusted. It's something as silly as that, but like it, can, it, cannot even, it might not even be an extreme example, but it can be very um, uh, influential in how people perceive your information. Platforms, very important. Facebook is not universal. Twitter is not universal. TikTok is not universal. Instagram is not universal. All these things are different ways to get to different people. Even in platforms like Facebook, you can do paid ads and sure that's valuable, but sometimes peer to peer connections like mentioning a new Westies are the besties. Um, that's that's a peer to peer thing, right? That's personal connections. Uh, sure, it might not be a super direct one to one group, but um, people finding information on that uh, on that sort of platform within Facebook are, are more likely to engage than if they just get a, an ad, a paid ad, right? Uh, if you find people talking about it in groups that you like, like uh, another one that I, a colleague was uh, talking about COVID moms. Um, the, the, the This was something that they're talking about how to get support for uh, your kids uh, for work from home. I can't remember if that's the exact name, but it was, it was along those lines. Um, and 
sure. You, there have been a lot of groups, organizations that have put out ads on how to support your kids in childhood education at home, but people still went to mom groups on Facebook to talk to other moms about how they're uh, about how they're supporting their kids. Right? It's just how people how people interact. Localizing your message. This doesn't need to be said. I'm sure in New West, uh, as a city, you feel that everybody focuses on Vancouver and Surrey and Richmond and Burnaby and just and, and tries to like generalize a message in the region. People are influenced by their neighborhoods. The messaging really matters. Groupthink is very real among blocks. And so sometimes uh, specifying things, even within, say, for example, um, within a Surrey town center, uh, like a Fleetwood is not going to have the same uh, perception of something as Newton uh, within that, right? So being that specific can really help hone in on your audience's interests. Um, for example, if someone tells you that they're interested in science and technology uh, and you happen to be a scientist, what do you think is better? Seeing that, oh, I work on a project that deals with space. Or would you say, oh, I'm actually working on a project that's going to land a probe on the moon. It's like, they're both the same things. None of it, none, neither of them were inaccurate. Yeah, sure. It's, it is space stuff, but like being super specific to something that people might be engaged about, that's important. Um, I understand that people of different income levels and spending abilities process their priorities differently. If someone is working paycheck to paycheck to pay the bills and eat, they do not have the time and luxury to think about causes that do not affect their lives. They're not selfish people. They're just trying to live. They, they like, for example, this is this is you always see these articles about COVID and things like that. Like, like people with economic stressors will turn to super relevant chunks that are very that speak to them directly, right? Like, it, like, do we really think that a renter making fifteen dollars an hour is really going to care about the urgency that they see in the Economist about cooling down real estate prices because a market correction would cause like a lot of innocent people to lose their life savings? like sure i'm sure that's a very important issue like i, I i'm sure that a lot of people who've tied up all like who've tied up their savings and equity yeah like i i can see how that's a problem for you but as a person who could be evicted uh like just like that not not on the top not at the top of the suggestion box right uh for, for me to be thinking about so um family and relationship status really important um i mean I, i'm not going to elaborate on that too much People who have kids know that like they process things very differently than people who don't. People in a relationship process things very differently than people who are single. Um, lastly, this is what I want to spend a little more time on. Um, gender identity, expression, sexual orientation, immigration status, language ability, ethnicity, generally like it falls under the umbrella of intersectionality. These all shape preferences, how you process information, like I said, a same infographic 10 times in 10 different ways can speak to people's individual differences very effectively than putting out a big report that then people are just supposed to read, right? It's very important to remember, like take for example, someone who is a first generation immigrant to Canada, um, who probably grew up in a different social system and had to relearn things when moving here, has experienced a very different Canada from the beaver tails, the tragically hip, the air farce, Anna Green Gables, Canada, right? Like all that Canadiana, they just can't relate. They've heard of it, sure, maybe. Um, and, and they probably think they're wonderful things, but that's like, it, it's, it's not a different country. It's, it's, just a, it, it's not the country they've experienced. It's like, they, they're not experiencing, two people can experience the same situation very, very differently. And that, that includes things like a city. Um, and so if you're trying to talk to somebody in that situation about Canadian society and democratic engagement and getting involved in all of that in these issues and in the, in the, say for example, the political process, you're going to need to need to do a lot more because voting systems are not uniform everywhere. They might not even understand Canadian federalism the way it is. That that, that itself isn't universal, right? Like uh, like I I was not born in this country. I moved here. I I was born in the, and raised in the Middle East. Um, I I'm not a citizen of that country. We didn't have the right to vote. Like it, 
like we don't have freedom of speech it is illegal to criticize the government like and and so it's it's not that people think that it should be that over here and so when you come here you don't think oh maybe maybe i should be reading op-eds about like what the government is doing maybe i should think critically about whether the government is doing a good job on x issue and then speak to my mp about it or my mla about it so it's like there are personal differences on issues like that like take for example the work the Canadian mental health association is doing I like again. I we, we've had uh we've had healthcare associations where I grew up. There was never a volunteer drive. There was never a chance to engage with the topic. They're not. They don't care about public delivery of programs. Um, it's really just a vehicle uh to get the money where it needs to go for the medical research to then operationalize in the hospital. You come to the hospital, you get your treatment, and then you leave. Um, and, to, and not to mention the fact that specific to the mental health association, yeah, mental health is not really a thing, uh, like an accepted thing. In, in, in uh, where I was growing up, there's a lot of stigma. People, people are just like, "Well, are you depressed? Well, well, watch a funny movie." Like th th that. That's still a level of understanding for many parts of the world. When people are moving here, guess what? They, they never knew that. Oh, actually, addiction is a disease. Like it's a mental health illness. Like we we need to we, we need to not be we need to not be penalizing people. We need to be approaching them with care and consideration and providing health and uh, health care and support to these people. The the people still view drugs in much of the world as a moral failing, a personal moral failing. And so it's not that anybody's trying to be a bad person. Again, people don't know what they don't know, right? Same thing about LGBTQ issues. They don't know that oh, um, it, it's uh, like it, in a in a lot of in a lot of the world, homophobia or queer phobia in general uh, is is quite literally a phobia. People physically think that a person who is that way is going to attack them. Like it, it and so they don't understand that oh okay, there's like nothing to it. It's just a person trying to live their life that's that's just how how things are uh, on the on the other foot somebody who is a part of a queer community uh after experiencing systemic violence uh processes and trusts of institutions at a very different level than somebody who is not within those communities right and so specifically speaking to those experiences and storytelling that's very important so i've gone I, I really wanted to emphasize on that part because selecting your audience is very important uh it, it it can affect even within a particular project not everything about that project might be relevant to everyone and it's perfectly fine it's and some people think that oh I, I feel like i'm hiding things about the project not necessarily if you're if you have an information place where people can refer to if they want to learn more that's fine but sometimes there's people consider things that are not relevant to them as noise, even if we don't. So uh, I'm just going to quickly go over these a couple of uh, and I promise we'll get back into some interaction in just a bit. I just want to go over some quick examples just to make sure that I'm not providing you with enough uh, exact like uh, real world uh, situations to show that these things could actually work. Um, spending time on this doesn't have to be expensive. You don't need fancy design software. I don't use fancy design software. I know how to use fancy design software, but that's not the thing I used in my day-to-day -day life because I just don't have the time. Um, um, you don't need a very specialized degree to do this. That being said, this is a little complicated. It does take a lot of time and practice. And sometimes some people are just better than it than others because they have a creative eye. The point I'm trying to make is you don't need to have a bachelor's in visual design in order to be able to do these things. Uh, is sometimes you can find the right people who know instinctively or just by life experience how to communicate to different communities, how to present an information in, in a way that really reaches out to them. And they've never had a user experience class in their life, right? Again, none of what I'm saying is 100% guarantee. Right, um, things are super customizable, and just because something doesn't work sometimes, that does not mean that that you failed necessarily. It's a learning opportunity. It's a great place for reflection on what can be improved. Um, I approach this in my day in my day to day job. I constantly get feedback on things that aren't even meant to be critical. But when I'm looking at people's feedback, even if they think they're complimenting me, I'm like, huh. 
that's not the compliment I was going for, or sorry, that's not the information I was going for. And so I see the points that I wanted people to pick up from that didn't land. And so I'm always trying to inter introspect how information can be put up better. The one size fits all approach, yo, no, you only need one. Really let's move away from that. Repeat, repetition of the same document does not mean that you're that you're lazy, unproductive, uh, not getting content out. Volume isn't, uh, volume can be a good thing if there's quality. Just putting a volume of documents as one-offs like, is probably not the most effective way. Uh, and sometimes you need to, you need, really need to go back and, and, and change how you do uh, things even mid campaign. There's no shame in admitting week to week that something's not working and you need to change things. It's better to do that than at the end of it, report to a funder, oh, we didn't achieve all the KPIs we needed to. Um, sorry. Uh, and so it's better, it's better to say, this is the learning experience here. This is what we're doing. This is how we're improving, maintaining that, maintaining that constant uh, critique. That's important. Also, um, at the, I've already talked about this. Learning is a two-way street. When you're deploying programs, give space for people uh, who are engaging with those programs to teach you about the topic. Like, because if you're going to, if, if you're doing it right and you're going to an audience that finds it super relevant, they're going to teach you things that you didn't know. Like I, like, and these are like, I've been working on some of the issues that I work on in my day job for a long time. And I'm working with PhDs who know, and we still go into communities and we're like, oh, okay. And these are people who like worked with planners in TransLink in Metro Vancouver, who've done like, who are like doctorates in urban planning. And they're like, oh, okay. I didn't really think that somebody who was there would interact with mobility options in that way. Um, that really changes things and how we need to build. And it could, it shifts millions of dollars like in investments, right? So always understand that learning is a two-way street on that. And there's no shame in changing things. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to quickly point to uh, an example if that's okay. This was a project that I worked on at the end of last year, uh, in the fall of last year. Um, it's a, it, 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 it wasn't supposed to be a public document. It was supposed to be an internal uh, thing for stakeholders because of the design of putting out information on a super technical report. They decided, oh, this is actually super great. We can put it out uh, as a public facing document. This, the the content itself is an important uh i mean there is a website you can go to but essentially you can see that i'm using a lot of negative space over here colors constantly change not every page has to be white some can be if you really want if you have to get a legal information in a certain way but everything like there's no there's no reason why this can't be single sentence bullet points right but if you eliminate that and try to put it in a new format where people kind of have to interact and really pay attention, like putting things out in bold coloring, really try to visualize things for people, understanding that uh, like different, uh, different people uh, pay attention to different things, um, that's a, that can really help how uh, people engage with something. Like everything in this document is super technical. We've had people who've gone through, again, you can see page 19 over here, page 20, page 21. Like, and, and, and over here, for example, I'm talking about deploying cancer, cancer isotopes uh, from uh, the BC Cancer Agency to, uh, to uh, Victoria for some of, uh, for some of the, uh, the cancer uh, the, uh, treatments, radiotherapy. Again, like who in the public uh, like sure it's important yeah but who in the public is going to think about this like we're building a whole strategy to inform the public about how we're using air drone technology to cut cut down the time in uh, shipping these cancer isotopes so that people can get radiotherapy care uh, much quicker like it's um, like all of these things again um, like I could have put out I didn't need to put out a 21 page document right I could all all of this text all of this, if I if I change the font size to type 11, put everything into a bullet point where it needed to be, and I, I could have fit this all guaranteed within five pages. But I can also guarantee at the same time that 
half the people or a quarter of the people would have actually read those five pages, all of them who have already been experts who contributed to the document in the first place, just looking at which parts of their of their contributions actually made it in there. Um, and, and the majority of people just wouldn't have taken anything from it. Of the people that we released it to uh, in the circles, everybody um, read it. And, and, and I'm not kidding when I say everybody, because I got feedback. Uh, on the content, people had opinions to, to share people had, okay, these are the people were able to list, okay, these are my action items from this. These are the things I need to be working on. They're like, oh, your organization is doing this with the cancer isotopes. Okay, I need to be I need to be, I need to be looking at this regulation. Then, Like, again, those are the things you know, without having to put out a survey that you, yes, the message has sunk in the deliverables of the project have sunk in, the details on, on the implementation have sunk in. So again, I've talked a lot. I've talked your ear off. I, I know like this is a lot of uh, stuff to come across. I hope it's been super useful for people. Um, and I'm gonna open it up so that we can uh, hear from you folks. Uh, but yeah, feel free to let me know what lands for your organization, what doesn't land. I'm here to learn because I can tailor this too. If, if it doesn't work for your organization, I can go back and try to study um, how, it, how it could be better. So yeah, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and stop talking for a little bit. Thank you so much, Jude, for the fantastic um, presentation. Really love that example. Um, I just wanted to, to just give us all a little bit of a time cue. We do have about 15 minutes left in our scheduled session, and we know some folks may have, need to drop off. So please feel free to do that and don't feel badly if you do need to go. Um, but we do have 15 minutes left. So uh, please share yeah, uh, specific questions for Jude, um, reflections on his, his uh, presentation presentation, um, specific projects you're working on that you could use a bit of advice on. Um, this is your time. Hi, Jude. Uh, great presentation. Thank you so much. It was really useful information. Um, my question is, uh, so Nima's Hospital Society is going to be opening up a thrift shop um, coming this summer. There's lots of I guess it's like we're in the expansion phase of, you know, the organization. It's going to it's like a turning point, I think, right now. And we're trying to get people engaged. And I hate to use the word excited ever about hospice care. And, you know, like that's not, but you know what I'm saying, right? Just the, the yeah. engagement and conversation and, uh, you know, getting people kind of involved or, or let's say for the thrift, the thrift shop um, thing, just engaging the community. We're going to need a lot of items, you know, probably raise funds for um, a future hospice residence. And that's where we're kind of like the goal that we have. So, you know, like, how do you, how do you start a conversation like that? It's, I don't want, it's not something that you just throw online. I don't think, you know, like as a message or a text, or it needs to be words, I think, you know, and aside from the one-to-one, -one, what do you think? So this, this is the thing, right? People, I mean, we don't like talking about death. It's it's it, it, like mortality scares everybody. We we, we oh. assign we, we assign culturally like ooh mm, mm, I can't. We have to be very somber, very dignified about it. Uh, it's and sure yes, a lot of people um, when they hear like the, I, I'll admit when when I heard uh, when you first came on the call and I was like I work for the New West Hospice Society. The first thing I was like, oh, you know, it's like right. it, yeah. It, it's you're like oh yeah yeah that's right there, there are people in hospices and it's like so let's let's try to see okay what are the positives in people's stories that you can draw out that don't necessarily speak to the confines of a hospice or palliative care speak to the the people in the hospice as individuals right they each have their stories they've had their lives however long however short um, they, they've, they've, they have stories to tell, right? Uh, and, and it doesn't have to always be centered around the work off the hospice. They were people before they got there, right? And so, uh, and sometimes phrasing that in, a, in an inspirational, sometimes heart tugging, like making people laugh, making people cry, 
and like there's a reason theaters ancient greek theaters focused a lot on tragedy and comedy right like give it like tugging people in those emotional directions of like it, it evokes uh, it evokes a deeper sense of engagement you can be positive about stories and content without seeming ir uh, irreverent uh toward towards it so in that case i would say if you're trying to get excited about the thrift shop um again what are the goals behind why you're uh, launching the thrift shop it's i'm assuming it's to raise funds right for uh, mm -hmm. running the hospice itself and so okay um it doesn't like sure you're trying you're you're communicating that you're opening a thrift shop great people got that right you can that's that's the volume of what you're putting out that's the takeaway i'm opening up a thrift shop um and you can give all the details of the address where it'll be how to find it everything but when you really want people to engage if i were to put out ads content info about that i'd focus a lot on the storytelling but and and not just in the like oh you know for a dollar a day you too could save like somebody's life because they've heard that a lot yeah. right and and that message tunes out but sometimes it doesn't even have to be about it doesn't even have to be about the ask sometimes you just want to tell the story of somebody somebody who's really awesome in the hospice somebody who's been working in the hospice who's a who's 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 gone out of their way to really help somebody um I would also say having people amplify your message who you who have platforms like new west I, I envy how tight knit of a community it is finding people who have that capital within the community to amplify the stories show the engagement tapping into those peer-to-peer -peer networks uh and again centering it around human experience like uh, it, like every, everybody's somebody's relative sure people have family relationships that are that are that are great not some, some not great but everybody's somebody's relative everybody i'm everybody knows somebody who's died right so it's and so it's like if you're able to really break past the oh we're raising this for our ops but like here's like meet the people who who we care for mm -hmm. like, and, it's, and i i've seen examples not of my own but uh, like ones that i'm learning from where sometimes i they don't even uh, in the first set of um ads, videos, promotion, social media content, they, they didn't even get to the ask yet. They, 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 they didn't even put out a why behind, oh, like for example, they didn't even talk about opening up a thrift shop yet. They, they started out the campaign and laid the groundwork as in like, here are the stories of the people who would be affected by so-and-so. Like these are, the, these, are, these are the people who are like, even, even without effect, like, like, come see the awesome people. Get to know the awesome people. There are human beings that we care for. Hear more about them. These are people with their own experiences. They've done amazing things in their lives. That's inspirational. Like, th there's a reason why now you see a lot of times that it, that it goes viral and people are like, oh my God, this is so hard touching. This made my day. Of like stories, like you, you see oftentimes where if you're the first kid in your, in your family to go to university or to get a postgraduate uh, degree, like become a doctor or something, uh, people, people do videos of uh, their parents opening their acceptance letter and then like just filming that reaction and all that because it's like people can relate. People are like, yeah, I know what that feels like. And so, yeah, I don't want to be long-winded about it, but yeah, I would say before advertising about a thrift shop, like really get people engaged in, in who's working there, who's receiving care in the hospice, you know, uh, like, and, and really getting that amplification through existing platforms and people who you know have a voice because uh, I think you'll see a lot of movement there and excitement because if people are able to generate that among their peer networks, people will go with somebody, right? People will show right. up if they know that the community is coming there. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Then no. sorry for taking up the last of the oh, minutes. No. We got seven minutes. <laughs> I, I'm just happy. I'm just happy this is helpful for you folks. I, I mm -hmm. put this out with everything I know. So like, I'm just happy it's landing for people. So thanks. I think uh, Laura's got her hand up. Yeah, Laura, please jump in. Yeah, just a quick question. So with the Arts Council of New Westminster, we're a member group um, and our members consist of artists and donors. Um, and we often just sort of, all of our communication lumps them all together. <laughs> um, so specifically our strategic plan. So do you suggest maybe that we create a strategic plan that's you know, uses words that will relate to artists and then have a strategic plan 
with language that's focused on our donors? Is that something we should consider? Absolutely. Uh, and I would go a bit further. I would say even among your donors, if you find that their donor profiles, uh, like interests and in demographics, things like that, if it varies uh, and, and you start to see groups of that naturally forming, hone in on that because uh, donor profiles, uh, even, even in long-term stewardship uh, for, uh, for donors, that's a big thing. If they are very uh, interested in certain uh, social causes with art, expression, things like that. You need to know that, and that's a and putting on content that speaks to those interests. Uh, it it just shows them that you that you care about their funding, that that you value the the whether it's money or in kind. Um, for the artist, uh, artists similarly, if you start to see grouping similarities, uh, sometimes even. Uh, and I, I'm not sure what the capacity is like, but if you find that you don't have too many artists where, like, and you have the capacity to deal with this, uh, even in the individuality in some communications, it doesn't have to be super, super specific, but uh, you can tailor things um, like even in emails that are branded, uh, but uh, the it doesn't have to be like a regular uh, um, uh, blast email. It could be things where even though the, the branding is there, um, it speaks very specific to what that artist cares about, uh, what they're working on, if there's a particular expression or things that they they might like. I'm 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 not a, I'm not a fine artist, I, but if, if there are things that they're very uh, particularly interested, that's a that's a good way to go. Um, sometimes you might find that things need to be common between donors, artists, just for general housekeeping stuff. That's okay as long as you're able to then follow the principles of like okay, uh, if things have to be common and you can customize. How shiny can you make it uh, so that it's relevant, right? So try to try to compensate a balance over there because of something. If, if if you have to put up legalese, you have to put up legalese, right? But sometimes even within the legalese, if there are facts and figures that you want to pull out and make it exciting for people to get, that's always an option. And it, I, I personally, I'm of the belief that that's not a wasted uh, wasted use of resources. Wonderful. I will do one last call for questions. Uh, if we have, we have time for maybe one more brief one. All right. I'm not seeing any takers, so let's go ahead and uh, and wrap this up. Thank you again so much, everyone, for being here, um, and a big big thank you to you, Jude, for sharing um, your tips and wisdom with us. I think we got a few little catchphrases that we can all take away. Um, and keep in our minds as we craft uh, craft effective communications, like make it as shiny as possible. I, I'm going to take that one away for sure and customize for your audience or your stakeholders. So thank you so much um, for what you've brought. And I, I'm going to actually turn it over to Jen for our last word about how to keep in touch with us and learn about um, the next ones in these series and just uh, staying connected. So thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks everybody. Uh, just e echoing what everyone said, and thank you very much, Jude. Um, as some of some of you may know, the Venn series um, offers an honorarium to our speakers. Although one of the things that all of our speakers have delightfully done so far is they have chosen an organization to donate their honorarium to, and Jude has chosen the uh, Hogan's Alley Society, which is a really really fantastic organization. And I'm really looking forward to being able to write them a letter and send them a check. So thank you very much for donating your time. And uh, and for and for telling me who you'd like to have your honorarium donated to, so it's appreciated. Um, this uh, recording will be up on the city's YouTube channel probably tomorrow. Depends how fast my computer works. Um, and uh, I do promote all of the Venn series in our Invest New West newsletter, which is our economic development newsletter. Um, if for any reason you are not already signed up, you're welcome to email me again. It's j a r b o at newestcity.ca, and I'm happy to sign you up to that. Uh, and if you have suggestions for future ones, these are bi-monthly, so the next one's set, but I haven't set the rest. So please do let me know what topics you'd like to have covered, because we're really open to how can we learn from one another and share, and also share what's going on in our organizations. So thanks again to everyone for coming tonight, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in the community when we can gather again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye.